Why is it that people can be so wrong about such issues like, for example, politics, economy, abortion, immigration, or any other conflicting issue? Why are they so stubborn in their opinion, even when you are presenting them obviously correct arguments? Why do they keep rejecting correct arguments, often aggressively responding with insults, especially on the internet? Why are they so desperately trying to reach for counter-arguments, even for those that make no sense? If you've ever asked yourself these questions, then the answer probably was that they are manipulated, they are stupid, they are idiots. But are you sure that this is really the case? Can it be so simple? Does it really depend just on what people know and how smart they are? Does intelligence and correct knowledge allow people to accept correct arguments that contradict what they already know? I think that you may be suspecting that it's actually not that simple. Because it isn't. It's a bit more complicated. In reality, it's tied to a certain psychological concept called attitude. Simply put, attitude is an evaluation of an object, an evaluation which exists in our heads. We have an attitude towards some object when we like it or dislike it, when we think about it favorably or unfavorably. An evaluated object can be material, like a car or a person, or it can be something abstract, like an ideology. So far this description doesn't sound too impressive. We either like something or we dislike it. Big deal. But if it was so obvious, then the attitude concept would not have reputation as the most important concept in social psychology. It has such reputation because it has many important characteristics and it is tied to many important processes that govern our thinking. So important that I would even say that it is one of the most important concepts known to humanity. I've said known to humanity, but it actually isn't known to humanity, but only to a relatively small group of people. People who know about it because of their profession, people who are interested in it, people who stumbled upon it somewhere. The main purpose of this channel is to make that group larger. If you are not already, then right now you are becoming part of that group. We have to start it by describing various characteristics of the attitude concept. First, let's look at what attitudes are made of. According to the so-called multi-component model, attitudes have three components. Let's imagine several examples. You want to buy a car, and you form your opinion about various car models by careful analysis of their features. Engine, speed, fuel efficiency, safety. You watch a movie and say that the camera work is competent. You watch an interview with a politician, you consider his opinions closely and carefully and calmly, and conclude that they make sense. These are examples of cognitive components. The cognitive component of attitude refers to what we think, to our opinions, beliefs, convictions about an attitude object. The car is safe, the camera work is competent, the politician talks sense. These are statements that may come from cognitive components. Let's imagine different examples. You want to buy a car and you buy the one whose looks you like the most. You watch a movie and say that it was fun and exciting. You watch an interview with a politician, you are put off by his apparent arrogance and his constant smirk and you begin to dislike him. These are examples of affective components. The affective component of attitude refers to what we feel, to feelings or emotions linked to an attitude object. The car looks good, the movie is exciting, the politician is an arrogant asshole. These are statements that may come from affective components. The third of the components is the behavioral component, which refers to what we do, to our past behaviors regarding an attitude object. Past behaviors can also make us infer our attitude. It happens when we are not fully aware of our attitude towards a given object, when we are uncertain of our feelings towards that object. For example, when asked what we think about giving money to charities, we may remember that in the past we gave money to a charity. We may conclude from this that we are positive towards giving money to charities. Attitudes may contain all or just some of those components. For example, if you like a song, you are able to describe its characteristics that make it a good song, and you listen to it regularly, then your attitude towards it contains all three components. If you agree that a movie is good from a technical standpoint, but at the same time you are emotionally completely indifferent to it, then your attitude contains a positive cognitive component, but no affective component. If you simply like a certain smell, then your attitude has an affective component, but no cognitive component. Attitude components can be ambivalent. If you agree that a movie is good from a technical standpoint, but at the same time you find it boring, then your attitude has a positive cognitive component, but a negative affective component. If you agree that a movie is bad, but you still like it because you like its atmosphere, then your attitude has a negative cognitive component, but a positive affective component. 
although opinions like this are not expressed that often, since usually we don't think that something we like is bad. There can also be an ambivalence within a specific attitude component. For example, you like a writer because you like his books and he is funny during interviews, but at the same time you have some negative emotions towards him because you don't like his opinion on some issue that is important to you, like abortion or same-sex marriage. Our attitudes not always are visible to us. For example, you may not notice that you are behaving somewhat reserved in the presence of some newly met person, and you may not realize that it's because this person reminds you of some other person that made you feel uncomfortable that you knew during your childhood. Attitudes may also differ in how well formed or crystallized they are. For example, if you hate broccoli, then you will not begin to like it when you're in a good mood or when someone reminds you that it's healthy. Your attitude towards broccoli is well formed and crystallized. It doesn't change when circumstances change. Imagine a politician named John Smith. You know that in the past he was accused of tax evasion. If you do not have any crystallized attitude towards him when you are asked the question what do you think about John Smith who was accused of tax evasion, then you may give a more negative opinion than if you are simply asked what do you think about John Smith. The first question brings to your attention on information that may influence your attitude at the moment. This is a reason why results of various polls, surveys, inquiries, or questionnaires can be influenced by the form of their questions. The next characteristic of attitudes that we will talk about is their function, their purpose. Why do they exist? Psychologists describe several attitude functions. Let's look at the most important. Object appraisal function refers to the ability of attitudes to summarize positive and negative attributes of objects in our environment. It can help us to approach things that are beneficial to us and avoid things that are harmful. Basically, to seek pleasure and avoid pain. This function can be split into two more specific functions. Knowledge function, which is concerned with organizing information about attitude objects. Utilitarian function, which is concerned with maximizing rewards and minimizing punishments that result from attitude objects. Another function helps us to protect something that is very precious to ourselves. What do you think? Why is it that people sometimes develop dislike for a game that they are bad at? Why is it that people can derogate other people apparently just for the sake of it? Sometimes people dislike a specific game because their poor skills threaten their self-esteem, so they want to protect it by avoiding this game. Sometimes derogating other people is just a method of strengthening one's own ego by comparing oneself to the derogated people. Those are results of the ego defensive function, also known as externalization function. Its purpose is to protect our ego, our self-esteem, our self-image, and to allow us to feel better about ourselves. The third function is the value expressive function. Its purpose is to express an individual's central values that are so important that they become a part of one's own identity. Examples of attitudes that fulfill this function are attitudes concerned with issues like life goals, way of life, morality, personal freedom, politics. The fourth function is the social adjustment function. It fulfills the need to identify with people whom we like and to dissociate from people whom we dislike. For example, people who want to be accepted in a certain group may develop attitudes that are in line with attitudes of that group. In summary, attitudes allow us to categorize objects into groups and make decision-making easier and faster, allowing us to focus on other issues, help us express ourselves, help us think better about ourselves, help us relate to other people. In short, they help us to deal with our environment, with other people and with ourselves. Now, let's talk about attitude attributes that are important for understanding why so often it's so hard to convince people that they are wrong. But first, recall from your experience some of the issues that provoked the most heated discussions, that made people angry or even aggressive, and that created the most conflict. Remember them for later. Let's look now at the attribute called strength. Strong attitudes are those that have a very strong influence on thinking and behavior, remain stable over time, and are very resistant to persuasive attempts to change them. Attitude strength is influenced by several other attributes. Knowledge. How much information about an attitude object we have in our memory. Greater knowledge is associated with greater resistance to changes. Accessibility. How quickly we can retrieve this information. Greater accessibility is associated with greater resistance to changes. Certainty. How confident we are that our attitude is correct. Greater certainty is associated with greater resistance to changes. Ambivalence. We've talked about this attribute earlier. It tells whether we react to some characteristics of the object positively while negatively to others. Lower ambivalence is associated with greater resistance to changes. Extremity. How very positive, negative 
or neutral are related to this. Higher extremity is associated with greater resistance to changes, elaboration, whether the attitude is a result of an in-depth, highly detailed thinking or not. Greater elaboration is associated with greater resistance to changes. Intensity is the strength of our emotional reaction to the attitude object. Higher intensity is associated with greater resistance to changes. If you did what I asked of you earlier, then the issues you've remembered most probably are tied to the one of the four attitude types. First, attitudes tied to one's own self-interest. Examples of this type are what do you think about taxes that you have to pay? What do you think about the fuel price if you are a driver? What do you think about the cancellation of your favorite TV show? What do you think about that neighbor who plays music too loud? Second, attitudes tied to one's own core values, personal convictions about what is good and what is bad, how people ought or not to behave, what goals in life they should seek to attain. Examples of these are, what do you think about taxes in general? If you have a strong opinion about government's intervention in a citizen's life, what do you think about issues like abortion, same-sex marriage, death penalty, faith? Third, attitudes that result from our identification with the groups or other individuals who care about the attitude object or whose interests are tied to the attitude object. We hold an attitude of this type because its object is important to other people that we care about. Fourth, attitudes tied to our positive self-view. For example, to people who never cheated on an exam, their attitude towards cheating on exams may be tied to their positive self-view if this makes them feel better about themselves. A single attitude can be of many types. For example, a person's attitude towards abortion may be influenced by the group she belongs to, by her own values, and by the fact that it concerns her personally. Attitudes of the aforementioned types can have high value of the attribute called importance. They can be very important attitudes. Important attitudes are those that we care very much about, that are psychologically significant to us, in which we are strongly invested emotionally, and that motivate us to express them. And the most importantly, important attitudes are more resistant to change because they create a strong motivation to protect them. In result, people are actively trying to defend their important attitudes against arguments, against even facts that contradict them if otherwise they would have to change them. Imagine a person who lives in the West in the early years of the Soviet Union and only knows about the situation in the Soviet Union from the Soviet propaganda. He publicly praises this country and defends it from criticism. Imagine that sometime later, information about the real situation in the Soviet Union start to appear. Information about persecutions, purges and gulags. Do you think it will be easy for this person to just admit that he was wrong? That he was fooled by propaganda? Most often it won't be so easy. And it wasn't so easy for many Western intellectuals when such information started to appear. It's not so easy to accept that what you've been so strongly convinced about is very wrong. Even if you are an intelligent, educated intellectual. Important attitudes are one of the main reasons why you often see even intelligent people rejecting correct arguments and defending hopeless stances. But that's not all. The causes of such behavior are even deeper than that. It's not just simply an attitude that we defend here. It's something more concrete and perceptible. And I think that at this point you should be able to figure out for yourself what is this something. Let's look at several examples. The owner of a certain smartphone model is telling some other person that the smartphone is the best of all. That person proves him that there are better ones. He accepts this fact without any resistance. A person supported a certain bill passed by a party that he voted for. The bill was supposed to improve the economy, but it didn't. Now he's being criticized by the opponents of this bill, who proved from the start that the bill had no chance of reaching its goal. He agrees that he was wrong with supporting this bill. A journalist meticulously interviewed a politician. The politician generally came out well, but he stumbled once. Someone who watched it said that he stumbled once, and he should have thought that one thing more thoroughly, but generally he came out well. A person writes on an internet forum that he accidentally met a famous actress, asked her for an autograph, and she seemed irritated by it. Someone reads this post and thinks nothing, because he doesn't care about that actress. Let's modify those examples a bit. In the first example, the smartphone owner responded by criticizing the favorite smartphone of the other person. In the second example, the party follower responded by trying to find excuses for why this bill didn't work and by criticizing the opposing party. In the third example, someone who doesn't like this politician said that he was talking bullshit like majority of his party does. Someone who likes this politician said that this lousy journalist is more suitable for an interrogator in a Stalinist arrest. In the fourth example, someone who likes this actress thought that she probably had a bad day and she didn't want to be disturbed. 
Someone who dislikes this actress thought that she must think that she's a big star. What's the difference between those groups of examples? The first group contains examples of reasoning that is objective in a sense that is not skewed towards a particular conclusion that we want to reach. We don't especially care whether the phone we own is considered the best or how the party we voted on is being judged by others, so we can accept any conclusion. The second group contains examples of the so-called motivated reasoning that leads us towards a predetermined conclusion. It appears when we are emotionally invested in a given issue and we have feelings related to it. And in the case of important attitudes, we are very invested in them and we have strong feelings. The thinking process about issues relevant to such an attitude is governed by the motivated reasoning. It helps people to reach conclusions that allow them to defend their feelings by arguing in a way that helps to defend the attitude tied to those feelings. It's not so easy to change strong feelings just like that, even when being persuaded by strongest arguments. It's easier to protect them. In effect, people are able to desperately stick to attitudes based on incorrect information, not because, as other people may think, they are stupid or manipulated, but because they feel. It's all about feelings, our vulnerable, precious feelings. Even intelligent people can start talking nonsense when they are motivated to protect their feelings regarding a particular issue. Instead of drawing correct conclusions, we draw conclusions that allow us to not change our feelings, and we do not realize that we are doing it. We also do not realize that in different circumstances our thinking could have been different, because person A plus knowledge B about issue C plus pre-existing attitude D equals conclusion E. Person A plus knowledge B about issue C plus pre-existing attitude F equals conclusion G. Pre-existing attitude modifies the conclusion, and this pre-existing attitude could have been shaped differently in different circumstances. Imagine a young person who is only just learning about an issue like, for example, death penalty, genetically modified food, or safety of atomic energy, and has little knowledge about it, no opinion about it, no feelings related to it. If everything this person learns is biased towards one side of the issue, then this person may develop opinions and feelings that are biased towards that side. From now on, everything this person thinks about this issue will be more or less biased towards that side. Person A plus circumstances B equals attitude C about issue D. Person A plus circumstances E equals attitude F about issue D. But how exactly do people defend their attitudes? I've already presented several examples of argumentation in defense of an attitude, but there actually exist hundreds of various ways of thinking and argumentation that allow us humans to build attitude on flimsy foundations of wrong information and incorrect arguments, and then to defend it. Forcing information inconsistent with our attitudes to travel through our minds like that? While consistent information is free to travel through our minds like that. If you do not know what tricks human mind uses to achieve this, then you may not even notice when it happens. In general, there is really no escape from those treacherous ways of thinking. We cannot really eradicate them, but we can learn about them, learn to recognize them, and minimize their negative effects. That is what we will do in the future videos.